John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah glory, glory, Welcome to hallelujah. War of the Rebellion Stories of the Civil War, I am your host, Leon, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross Antietam to Appomattox, the Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania. 1861 to 1865 campaigns 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. And we are on to Chapter 17, Appomattox Incidents. Homeward March. Incidents of Flag of Truce. Sergeant Shore's Reception of Truce Bearer. Return of Army to Washington. Fifth Corps Reviewed in Petersburg by General Warren. March of Troops through Richmond. Grand Review in Washington. Farewell Address of General Meade to Army of Potomac. Return of 155th to Pittsburgh. Public reception and dinner. Parade and public exhibition and drill in Allegheny Parks. Regiment mustered out of service. Number of Confederates paroled. According to the records of the War Department, the number of officers and enlisted men of the Army of Northern Virginia paroled at Appomattox on the 9th of April, 1865, was a total of 22,335 infantry, composed of Gordon's and Ewell's Corps. The Cavalry and Artillery Corps and detachments swelled the grand total up to 28,356 men. It has been stated that of the troops surrendered, only 8,000 had arms in their hands. If this was correct, then the greater part of those men who had no arms must have thrown them away when they found they must surrender. The casualties of the Union Army in these closing operations, from the 29th of March to the 9th of April, of officers and enlisted men, killed, wounded, and missing, made a total of 9,944. General Griffin, to whom Grant assigned the order of arranging the final details for the surrender and parole of Lee's army, in compliment to General Joshua L. Chamberlain, commanding the 1st Brigade of Bartlett's division, designated him to command the parade and final review. General Chamberlain, who, in acknowledgment of his valuable services on many a bloody field, and at Gettysburg in particular, had been assigned the honor of receiving the arms and colors of the Confederate Army, asked for the famous old 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division of the 5th Corps, with which he had been so long identified. His request was granted, and it was the 3rd Brigade, including the 155th, that he found in line of battle on the morning of the 12th of April, 1865, to participate in the last ceremony of the formal surrender of Lee's once magnificent army. General Lee's Clemency to Spy at Appomattox During Lee's retreat, after the evacuation of Richmond and Petersburg, Sheridan's cavalry scouts, dressed in Confederate uniforms, freely intermingled with the Confederate troops. Three of these Union scouts, one of whom was Arch H. Rowand, Jr. of Pittsburgh, serving as a private of Company K, 1st Regiment, West Virginia Cavalry, and at present a well-known member of the bar, were captured on April 7th near Appomattox Courthouse. They were tried during the bivouac at night by a drumhead court-martial. All were found guilty of being spies, and one of them was sentenced to be shot at daylight the next morning, the 8th of April. The other two succeeded in making their escape from the Confederate guards. During the progress of the war, General Lee had, for reasons satisfactory to himself, issued an order that all proceedings and findings and summary court-martials involving capital punishment should be submitted to the Commander-in-Chief of the Confederate Army for approval before being carried into execution. On the occasion referred to a courier from General Gordon, bearing the findings of the court-martial against the spies, reached General Lee's headquarter bivouac in the early hours of the morning, 
Colonel Charles Marshall, Assistant Adjutant General and Military Secretary to General Lee, first received the papers from the courier, and proceeding to General Lee's headquarters, awakened him and presented the important paper to him for approval. General Lee, sitting up in his tent and looking over the documents by the light of a tallow dip candle, remarked, perhaps with well-founded apprehension of the morrow's catastrophe to the Confederate Army, quote, Colonel, do you not think there has been enough blood spilled in this dreadful war without shedding any more uselessly? Carrying this sentence into execution under the present circumstances can serve no useful purpose. Therefore, the further execution of the sentence will be postponed for the present. Unquote. The Colonel, Charles Marshall, mentioned above, was later, and until his death a few years ago, a prominent and distinguished member of the Baltimore Bar, with a well-earned legal reputation throughout the country. Colonel Marshall and Scott Rowand Exchanging Reminiscence Many years after the close of the war, Colonel Charles Marshall, who, as previously stated, had served as Chief of Staff to General Lee throughout the Civil War and at Appomattox, attended an important case in Pittsburgh as attorney for Baltimore parties. Before the late Honorable J.W.F. White, Judge of Common Pleas Court No. 2 of Allegheny County, at the close of the arguments, General A.L. Pearson, Judge Slagle, John H. Kerr, Charles F. McKenna, E.A. Montooth, and Arch H. Rowan, Jr. of the Pittsburgh Bar, all of whom had taken part in the surrendered Appomattox and were familiar with the Colonel Marshall's part therein as a Confederate officer, tendered an informal reception and collation at the Hotel Henry to Colonel Marshall. The former Union Scout, Arch H. Rowan, Jr., exchanged interesting reminiscence with Colonel Marshall about the last days of the Confederacy in the Appomattox campaign, when his fellow scout of Sheridan's cavalry was saved from death through the clemency of General Lee in suspending execution of sentence after the scout had been condemned to death by a drumhead court-martial. Colonel Marshall took occasion to congratulate Comrade Rowand on his opportune escape from the Confederate camp, and the drumhead court-martial and sentence, which also awaited him on the same occasion, when General Lee declined to have his convicted messmate shot at daylight. Comrade Rowand, at the time of his capture, as a Union scout by the Confederates, wore the uniform of a company of South Carolina Confederate cadets, with whose dialect and style young Rowand, in early boyhood, by reason of residence, had become quite familiar. A Medal of Honor was awarded Comrade Rowand by Congress on recommendation of General Phil Sheridan, for important services, rendered the Union cause as a scout in various campaigns of the Union Army. Form of Appomattox Paroles Questioned General J. L. Chamberlain, the Union general detailed to receive the formal surrender of the Confederates, describes the preliminary conference he had with General Henry A. Weiss, the senior Confederate division commander, the remnants of whose command were about forming preparatory to stacking arms and disbanding. In the midst of the prevailing excitement, General Weiss, who in civil life was known as one of Virginia's greatest lawyers, earnestly expostulated with General Chamberlain on what he termed the ridiculous proposition then about to be enacted of paroling an army without the signature of each paroled individual. General Weiss indignantly inquired if there were no lawyers among the generals or leaders of Grant's army to insist upon the individual signatures of each and every Confederate to be paroled, averring that it was unprecedented and a very doubtful force whether the commanding officers of regiments could sign binding paroles for the men of their respective commands. As the Articles of Surrender between Lee and Grant provided, General Chamberlain declares that he suppressed his feelings of amusement as a venerable General Weiss's indignation and profound concern over the technical question of the validity of paroles of the Confederate rank and file, all of whom had endorsed most heartily General Lee's actions in surrendering his army. He closed the discussion with General Weiss by expressing the opinion that, as subordinate officers of Grant and Lee, General Weiss and himself, had no other course than to cheerfully obey the orders of their commanding officers. The Various Flags of Truce Much has been said, and written about the various flags of truce which preceded the formal execution of the papers of surrender by General Lee in the McLean House. Colonel Charles Marshall, who at Appomattox made the copies for Grant and Lee of the terms of capitulation, has declared that so many stories have been told about the flags of truce at Appomattox 
as almost to convince him that he was not present on the morning of the surrender, as he saw no flag of truce at all. It is certain, however, that on account of the difficulty in reaching Lieutenant General Grant on that morning, located in a distant portion of the army, quite a number of messengers and flags of truce were hastily sent through the lines of the Union Army, by direction of General Lee. From the council of the night previous it became known to Generals Longstreet and Gordon that the surrender of General Lee of his army had been determined upon, and that all were anxious to avoid further effusion of blood. However, the advanced vedettes of the 155th Regiment, occupying the skirmish line of the 5th Corps, on the advance at Appomattox on the morning of the 9th of April, 1865, saw a mounted staff officer leave the enemy's columns just outside the village of Appomattox, carrying on his uplifted sword a white object like a towel, evidently intended as a flag of truce. General Griffin, commanding the corps, also observing this plain movement of the officer, dispatched Captain George M. Loglin, senior aide-de-camp of his staff, to the 155th, occupying the skirmish line, with orders to cease firing because of the approach of the rider with the flag. The young Confederate officer, bearing the flag of truce on reaching the skirmish line, was first stopped by Sergeant Major William Shore, to whom the officer spoke, remonstrating that his flag of truce was repeatedly fired upon. To this, Sergeant Major Shore responded that until the Confederates quit firing, the Union troops would not cease their firing. Sergeant Shore gave the flag bearer a safe escort through the skirmish line to Colonel Pearson, now in command of the brigade, who in turn passed the bearer with Captain George F. Morgan of the 155th, a staff officer, along to General J. L. Chamberlain, commanding the division, and from thence by escort the officer was finally passed to General Grant, whose headquarters at that time was some miles distant in the rear of Appomattox some miles distant in the rear from Appomattox. Until General Grant's reply was received, a long wait occurred, and the status quo at the front of both armies was preserved, but under the greatest strain and tension. Sergeant Major Shore's participation in the reception of this flag of truce delivered so conspicuously by the Confederate courier was corroborated in a singular manner many years after the close of the war. Sergeant Major Shore, in 1903, while serving in the employ of the city of Pittsburgh, read of the appointment of an ex-Confederate veteran to the United States Judge of the District of Alabama. The item stated that this judge, being then a boy of 19, had ridden across the open field at Appomattox with a flag of truce on his uplifted sword and had passed through the Union skirmish line and was at once escorted to General Grant with Lee's final message for the surrender on April 9th. Sergeant Major Shore opened correspondence with the newly appointed judge, Honorable Thomas E. Jones and interesting letters passed between the two. This interesting correspondence will be found in report of Bellevue Reunion, 1907, in this history. While the Fifth Corps was in line of battle immediately after the flag of truce, and pending the arrangement of Generals Grant and Lee for the surrender and parole of the latter's army, quite an exchange of courtesies was taking place between the Confederate generals and Union generals with their staffs. And particularly between those officers who had been cadets together at West Point. Generals Custer and Merritt were particularly fraternal with Generals Fitzhugh Lee and Lomax, Confederate cavalry leaders. So many evidences of mutual joy and friendship were exhibited that it became difficult to tell from the conviviality and hilarity which were the victors and which the vanquished. General Fields, commanding a division of the Confederate Army under Longstreet, opposite the position held by the 5th Corps and the 155th, had been a classmate at West Point with General Charles Griffin. General Field sent his compliments to Griffin by an aide, whereupon General Griffin dispatched Major Lawlin of his staff, with his compliments to General Fields to escort the latter to his headquarters as his guest pending the paroling ceremonies, then being arranged to take place a day or two later. The hospitality of General Griffin was gratefully accepted by General Fields, and the greeting of the two classmates of the 50s at West Point was cordial in the extreme. The Confederate officers' mess chest and wardrobes had become quite reduced by the fall of Petersburg and Richmond, and the harassed retreat of the Confederate army, and the capture of their wagon trains by the Federal Cavalry. General Fields, therefore, apologized for his fatigue attire, and his inability to return the hospitalities of General Griffin's larder. General Griffin, being an abstemious man, had to dispute the distribution of the champagne festivities with his Confederate guest to the other generals of his corps, who did not share his prejudice against the limited use of ardent spirits, especially to the stranger within their lines. 
It was said, however, that General Griffin, before their final parting, insisted on his Confederate guests accepting a substantial roll of money for his immediate expenses. General Fields was a brave soldier, having been in the war from the first Battle of Bull Run to Appomattox, and during his visit to General Griffin, the latter sent for General Ayers to come and meet Fields, both Griffin and Ayers having participated in the Battle of Bull Run in the artillery service, and having commanded bodies of troops down to Appomattox. Magnanimity of General Grant It is related by the late Major George M. Loughlin that on the evening of May 5th, 1864, in the bivouac of General Meade's headquarters in the wilderness, an informal council of war was held. A preliminary discussion took place as to the terrible carnage which had occurred that day in the various divisions of the Fifth Corps, and the inadequate gains as to position or advantages. On this occasion, General Griffin, whose division of the Fifth Corps had opened that memorable battle and suffered such severe losses, expressed his views to General Meade, presiding, in very forcible terms, denouncing it as in an inexcusable blunder to fight under such disadvantages of position, and also characterizing in severe terms the losses occasioned in the rank and file of his command as, quote, useless slaughter, unquote. Lieutenant General Grant had just arrived at the meeting in time to hear the remarks of General Griffin. Though not addressed to him, he quietly expressed to General Meade the great surprise he felt that the latter tolerated any such remarks or criticisms from subordinate commanders, declaring that in the armies with which he had served in the West, the commanders never permitted such conduct. General Griffin, overhearing General Grant's expressed displeasure at his remarks, quietly withdrew from the informal council of war. General Griffin, it is said, subsequently expressed his belief that his earnest remarks criticizing the great and useless carnage of the first day in the wilderness would be remembered by Grant to his disadvantage in subsequent promotion. In this, however, General Grant was agreeably disappointed, as after Five Forks, when other generals were competing for the command of the Fifth Corps to succeed General Warren, it was Grant's act that awarded the distinguished honor to General Griffin, unsolicited and unexpected by him but much to the gratification of the rank and file of the Fifth Corps. When Lieutenant General Grant separated from General Lee and rode back to rejoin his own army where the various Union generals had assembled at Appomattox Courthouse, General Grant advanced and cordially greeted and shook hands with General Griffin, publicly expressing his thanks for and great appreciation of the services of the latter and of his brilliant handling of the Fifth Army Corps and the memorable pursuit of the Confederate Army. He also announced the permanent appointment of General Griffin to command the Fifth Corps. The magnanimity of the lieutenant general on this occasion overcame General Griffin, who, with unconcealed emotion, accepted the proffered hand and thanked General Grant for his generosity. News of Assassination of President Lincoln one of the most shocking experiences in the midst of great joy prevailing in the camps on the fall of Richmond and the surrender of at Appomattox was the intelligence of the assassination of President Lincoln. The president had but a few days before visited the Army of Potomac and General Grant at the latter's headquarters at City Point, and also General Butler's camps after the fall of Richmond, everywhere counseling, quote, peace and goodwill, unquote and laboring to bring about the restoration of harmony and peace to both sections. On his return to Washington, Mr. Lincoln had, in response to a serenade by the citizens of Washington, made an address which, for patriotism, charity, love, and Christian sentiment, seemed actually inspired. To the soldiers of the Union, President Lincoln was especially endeared. His personality was well known to the Army of the Potomac through his frequent attendance at its many reviews under McClellan, when camped in the vicinity of Washington and under Burnside and Hooker. Homeward March Through Petersburg Grand Review by General Warren The return of the army to Washington for disbandment after the surrender of Lee was delayed for some weeks because of the impediments to travel by the destruction of railroad bridges and the condition of the wagon roads, which at that season were almost impassable. This delay was very trying on the rank and file of the army, now so anxious to return home, 
from the 17th of April to the 5th of May, the 5th Corps, guarding army stores and resting, encamped at various points. On the 5th of May, 1865, the troops of the 5th Corps bivouacked for the night just outside the entrenchments at Petersburg, and the next day resumed their triumphant march through that city. No more impressive or touching scene occurred during the varied experience of soldiers in active service than the occurrence of the homeward march of the Union armies. The mingled emotions of the closing scenes of the war are hard to describe. The loss of dear comrades in battle. Marches. Sieges. All occupying the mind of the returning soldier, who was yet cheered and comforted with the knowledge of the triumph of the Union cause. And also by the thought of an early return home, and the receptions and the glory awaiting him on his native heath. On the 5th of May, a most memorable example of the earnest affection and deep emotion showed by the returning veterans of the 5th Corps for General Governor K. Warren, so long the commander of the 5th Corps, and at times previously identified with the 2nd and 3rd Corps of the Army of the Potomac, the youngest corps commander in the Army. General Charles Griffin, his successor as corps commander, with General Zayers, Crawford, and Chamberlain, division commanders, shared this affection for Warren as a brave soldier and chivalrous officer. General Grant had deservedly appointed General Warren on the fall of Petersburg to be governor of the city, which the latter had by his skill contributed so much towards capturing. The city of Petersburg, and its line of entrenchments, being on the route assigned for the homeward march by the Fifth Corps, it was determined by General Griffin to invite General Warren, as military governor, to extend to his late corps the honor of a public review as it passed through the, quote, the cockade city, unquote. Accordingly, preparations were made in all the regiments and batteries for the occasion. Instructions from officers were given for all the rank and file to prepare themselves, their uniforms and arms, in its best shape, for the farewell reception to their late beloved commander. The numerous bands and drum majors were also put upon their medal to do their best. The reviewing stand selected was a platform erected in front of the, quote, Bowling Broke House, unquote, which was occupied as the headquarters of the military governor and staff. On the reviewing stand with General Warren was Mrs. Warren, the bride whom he had married while on leave of absence en route to Gettysburg, and also a number of distinguished generals of the Army of the Potomac, staff officers and their wives. In the line of column being reviewed were 10,000 soldiers, survivors of the 25,000 who, during General Warren's command, had so faithfully followed the Maltese Cross from the wilderness to Appomattox. As General Griffin at the head of the Corps rode by, he saluted General Warren and joined him on the reviewing stand, as the bronzed veterans following General Zayers, Chamberlain, and Crawford, commanding divisions in the historic batteries of the Corps, obtained sight of their old commander, their emotions overcame them. The war being over and discipline relaxed, the men most enthusiastically saluted and cheered to the echo their old commander. The climax, however, of excitement and enthusiasm was reached when Warren's old brigade, composed of Zouave regiments, including the 155th, now commanded by General A. L. Pearson, reached the reviewing stand. These veterans were formed in what is known as open order maneuvers and carried their guns on their knapsacks, and with their tattered flags and weather-beaten faces, they seemed to be the very ideal of veteran soldiers. They halted before the reviewing stand, after saluting General Warren, and most enthusiastically cheered and cheered, adding, Tigers, until their officers ordered them to resume the march. The grand ovation, and tribute to Warren, so cordial and unanimous, should have gone far towards making his superiors right the recent wrong occasioned by his arbitrary removal from the command of the Fifth Corps in the supreme moment of victory at Five Forks. The people of Petersburg, who crowded the streets and occupied the windows and dwellings at the time, declared that they had never witnessed anything like the scene of this great military demonstration of the Fifth Corps through their streets. The miles and miles of ammunition and quartermaster trains, artillery caissons and ambulance wagons, which followed, were also a source of great surprise to the population, white and black, of Petersburg. On to Richmond. On the sixth day of May, the march of the Army Corps was continued to Richmond. The 155th, with the 5th Corps, rested at Manchester, 
outside of the city of Richmond, until the next day, when it passed in silence through the principal streets of that city. No band playing or other display, the ruins of the recent fire being visible. The Fifth Corps was reviewed by General Halleck, whose unpopularity to the soldiers in the field caused him to receive scant honors or cheers from the returning veterans. The army marched by forced marches by way of Hanover Courthouse, and by way of Fredericksburg towards Washington. The fatigue of these forced marches day after day was somewhat relieved by sights of many of the battlefields on which the 155th had fought, and over which they were now marching under such vastly changed conditions. The then unfinished white dome of the capital was at length sighted by the returning columns on the afternoon of the 12th of May, 1865. Cheer upon cheer was sent up all along the columns as the shining dome came into view, as expressions of the gladness and joy of the veterans, and of their gratitude that the war was really over. The Fifth Corps went into final camp about a mile from Falls Station on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. A few days later, General Sherman's great army arrived and encamped on the heights above Alexandria. Next week, we will go ahead and start at the Grand Review in Washington, and then we'll finish the rest of this chapter, and then after that, it's down to the individual men who write little anecdotes from their individual companies, and we'll start that. But we will start there and finish. You know, there's still a long way to go, a lot to cover. Um, I just want to make one quick note, is that I originally had set up having my Patreon subscribers be able to get merch. So you can, you're a Patreon subscriber for three months, you get a sweatshirt, so on and so forth. Well, in understanding how all of this works and wanting to work with the people who listen to my podcast, because you are the important ones, right? Like you guys are the ones who I'm listening to because you're the ones listening to me. That seems pretty fair, right? So... He explicitly asked me, like, hey, where can I buy merchandise to support your channel? I'm a loyal subscriber. And so I spent a whole day. It was very frustrating, but I spent a whole day setting up a merchandise store. But I didn't want to, like, cheat you guys. Does that make sense? Like, I see a lot of, I don't know. I, doing this kind of work, there's a lot of websites and stuff that are like, oh, like, do it through us and do it through this. And I kind of look at them like, no, that looks like garbage. So I had work commissioned. You can go to the website and you can check it out. The merch for that is just going to go on t-shirts and stickers and sweatshirts and face masks if you're into that. I just, I just thought it would be cool if I could wear, you know, like a COVID mask. With my own merch on it, I just like, hey, what's that? Oh, it's funny you should ask. It's my podcast. So uh, if you're still wearing a mask, uh, by all means, you, you'll be able to pick one up. You don't have to right now. I'm not going to post it on my website, on Facebook. I think it's still on there, but I haven't taken it down. Um, I have merch that's coming in next month through August like 1st through August 6th, I have different merch lines that are coming in. So you're going you're gonna to be able to see what the shirts look like, uh, the sweatshirt looks like. I didn't get one of each. I just, you know, and I've got coffee mugs too because I want to drink coffee out of my own merch cup. The new logo redesigns, they look really cool. Uh, one design is called Boys in Blue which has got Union soldiers charging against Confederate soldiers. Beautifully well done. And the other is just a really cool redesign of my current logo with the eagle and snake fighting each other. So go to rebellionstories.com. You can look at the redesigns. If you want something that looks like that's cool, like maybe a t-shirt or a mug or whatever, just know that you are supporting the channel. So if you look at it and you're like, wow, this price for a t-shirt is a little expensive. Yeah, man, because you're supporting my channel, and I really appreciate it. I'm not Walmart. This goes 
directly to funding the channel. So um, it's it's definitely 100%. I thank you. So pretty cool. That's coming soon. When I have all of that, probably not the next episode, but the one after that is when I'll start getting that stuff in. I will post on the website, rebellionstories.com, all of the pictures of all of that really cool stuff for you guys to look at. So that way you'll know you're not getting cheated. All right. Uh, if you already saw my merch line, that was an accident. It wasn't supposed to, you weren't supposed to see it. I'm, I'm not that good. I may have been born in the age of computers, but I'm not that good with them. So if you hadn't already checked the YouTube channel, check it out. There's another poem up uh, by one of our illustrious boys in the 155th. So you'll be able to take a look at that. And now let's get into this kind of cool events. This is a little bit more interesting. I mean, battles are interesting and all, but I really like the human connection that happens when we're talking about all of this stuff, right? So talking about the Confederates being paroled, the form of Appomattox paroles questioned with General Henry A. Weiss being a lawyer and General J. L. Chamberlain, who we all know, being the ones that have to like draw it up and him being a lawyer and being like, no, 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 every person has to sign this. Otherwise it's not real is incredibly delicious that this happened in history and we get to hear about it. I'm glad. So very lawyer thing. Uh, found that very entertaining. That's for sure. The news of the assassination of president Lincoln sucks. That probably takes the wind out of your sails with how victorious you feel. Like, hey, we're the Army of the Potomac. We just defeated the Confederacy. We beat Robert E. Lee. And then Lincoln is killed. That must have been awful. The Grand Review with General Warren. It sounds like those boys really liked him. My goodness. General Halleck later on in Richmond with his grand review, he doesn't get anybody, right? Nobody cares. Everyone's like, fine, we'll do it, but we don't have to like you while we do it, which I find very entertaining. For General Warren to just get the screaming and shouting and probably many huzzas is pretty good. I like that. Oh man, with that, my friends, I'm going to get out of here. I, uh, I have a lot to do. So I will see you next week. Check out at the website. I don't know, maybe next Wednesday or so. I am going to be doing live streams for the YouTube channel as well. The live streams are just going to be me chilling out. Like when I have time to play video games, I might live stream War of Rights or I might live stream Ultimate General Civil War, which is where you can command entire cores fighting. That's a really great game. You get to choose what kind of weapons your guys have, who leads them. You can promote generals and demote them. Or it's really nice. So I've got a couple Civil War games we'll probably run through, but just like when I'm playing War Thunder, I might just stream that too because I like flying B-17s. It was my childhood dream. So, you know, it's one of the few games that allows me to fly B-17s and the F-4F, which is also... You know, it's an ugly little fighter, but I still love it, even though it got replaced by the Corsair, you know, anyway. So if you check out my YouTube channel and you see one of the live streams uh, playing, stop by and say hello. I'm just going to be chilling out. And if you want to watch after the fact, yeah, come check it out. That way you can see kind of some of the really cool kind of video games that are going on. Watch some dogfighting or some tank battles. All right, friends, I'm getting out of here. I'm just rambling about all of my favorite things, but I guess that's what's great about having a podcast. All right, my friends, I'm getting out of here. I've been talking too long. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. And I will see you in the next episode. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Ah!
hallelujah for his soul is marching on John Brown was a hero a daunted true and brave and Kansas knew his valor when he fought a rights to save and now though the grass grows green above his grave his soul is marching on glory glory hallelujah He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so few And frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew But a soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah John Brown was John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see Christ who of the bondmen shall the liberator be And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on of freedom then strike while strike ye may the death blow of oppression in a better time and way the dawn of old john brown has brightened in the day and his soul is marching 